Hazard controls. We now need to look at the significant hazards and put in place control measures. We need to be able to answer the following questions. Are the control measures that we may already have in place adequate? And how are we going to maintain those control measures? So what you need to do is now have your team determine the control measure. By law, we have to consider the following three methods and apply them in this order. If practicable, eliminate. Otherwise, if practicable, isolate or else minimize. I'll define these shortly, but notice that the word if practical keeps coming up. What they're trying to say there is that you need some kind of reasonable guide to know how far you need to go to eliminate something or how much time and money you need to put into it. You know, what, what is reasonable for you may be different for someone else, I can guarantee that. Of course there is a limit and it's based around the definition of this word reasonable, which is important to know because that's what the law is looking at. And we want you and your system to be legally compliant. Whether a step is reasonable takes into account how seriously someone could have been harmed, how likely the harm is, how much is known about how to prevent it, and the availability and the cost of the safeguards. To understand this, we need to get into this process of risk management that I've spoken about earlier. This is really important to understand because it will help you decide what is practicable. Not only that, let's say you have two hazards you need to control, which one should you deal with first? Risk management is all about estimating the amount of risk and deciding what action to take. And we do it using this basic matrix. Using this risk matrix, we look at any significant hazard and therefore can apply a more scientific method of showing how we determine the risk involved. You will see on one side, on the left hand side, we've got the likelihood of things occurring from starting at the top, rear, increasing to almost certain. And then along the top, we've got the severity. You know, is it minimal or all the way to the right? catastrophic. Within your business you may wish to discuss the definition of the terms, but the following are a starting point. Minimal, say hardly any injury or illness, all the way to catastrophic, multiple deaths, multiple serious harm, critical damage to equipment. Likelihood can move from rare, never heard of this thing happening, all the way to almost certain the event is expected to occur in most circumstances, you know, pretty much daily. The risk then, if you look at a, if you look at something gauge using those definition, you can come up with a, a risk that can either be a word or a number. And then you can define within your team how you're going to respond to that risk. Is it low? So you're going to manage that risk by routine procedures, moving through to high, right? Senior management have some responsibility now and has specified what they need to do, and extreme, immediate action required. So when you're working through the risk matrix, you're going to come up with a risk score, a word phrase to define that risk. And, and it's really important that working through the process, you and your team don't get too wrapped around the axle about what category it actually belongs to. You know, is it intermittent or is it likely? There's going to be perhaps a few arguments over that. You know, the general principle is we're trying to find big picture outcomes. Let me give you an example. Me drinking a cup of coffee and burning myself while sitting at the computer. The hazard is a hot coffee and I would judge this as a rare likelihood that I would burn myself. I've never done it and have not heard of anyone else doing it, so I'm happy with the word or definition rare. However, if I did spill the coffee, it would probably be only a small amount and it is not piping hot as it's cooled down a little, so I give the severity or outcome rating as minor. So if you multiply those two together, the overall risk to me is low. Right, let's take the same cup of coffee and use a kindergarten example for a teacher. With the age and curiosity of kids, I would say an unattended hot cup of coffee would have the chance of burning a kid somewhere between 
once a year to once a month. So I'll just be safe and I'll call it intermittent monthly. And I would rate the consequences higher for the kids as they will probably be exposed to more hot coffee, they'd spill more, and perhaps it would cover more of their body percentage wise. So I'd give that um, a moderate rating. And if you multiply the intermittent and moderate, we come up with a moderate risk. The key though is that the same hazard has now moved from a low risk to a moderate risk. So with those definitions behind you now, I want to go back to our first step, step one. Pull out your hazard register and assign a risk score to all the significant hazards. Remember what we're trying to do here is work out what priority we should be working through them. Working through our printing press example, we've come up with a high and a low risk. So now we need to control the hazards, starting with the noise hazard using the eliminate, isolate or minimize control method. How do we do that? Well, elimination. If a hazard is eliminated, then it no longer exists. For obvious reasons, this is the most effective control and probably the most overlooked. So you need to start thinking, does the task need to be done or can it be completed in a different way? You can redesign or change or substitute equipment to remove the source of the temperature, noise or pressure. Can you redesign a process or use a different chemical Maybe redesign a workstation to relieve physical stress and remove ergonomic hazards. Remember the Air New Zealand example I gave earlier. Redesign general ventilation to include some fresh outdoor air to prevent the old sick building syndrome. For example, if you had a business and you had to work on roofs, working at heights is clearly a significant hazard. You determine it as a moderate risk to your business and one way to eliminate the hazard is to stop the work and close up shop. You know, there's no more working on roofs going on for you. However, how practicable is this as a control measure using the definition that we talked about earlier? Clearly the cost of this measure, i.e. going out of business, is not practical. However, it must be understood that employers cannot simply say that because a product or service is a core product of mine, then we don't have to eliminate it in any situation. The reality is, if it is significant and is a high risk and it can't be isolated or minimised, then elimination may be the only option, i.e. if we could not find other means to protect workers, then no more working on a roof. Another option is to build roofs at ground level. Much like they now build motorway bridges by first building a the bridge, then digging the tunnel underneath the bridge. However, you determine that you can't eliminate working at heights on your roofing business. So we move on to isolation. The hazard still exists, but the workers can't come into contact with it. The two major methods are enclosure or using barriers. Let's look at enclosure first. If you can pause the video and have a read. And then the other example is of using barriers or local ventilation. Machine guarding is a classic in the use of isolation. Minimization. This control method is the least effective because it relies on a lot of human interventions. And ironically, it's the most used control method. And it's where people go to first when they're thinking about control measures, which includes training or PPE, um, giving clear procedures or rules around the hazard, scheduling individual workers to reduce exposure, e.g. you're limiting time on the shift to reduce exposure to a noisy machine, or scheduling hazardous work to times when most staff are off-site, you know, in the evening or for maintenance work. The last two points don't resolve the problem, but all they do is reduce the risk to a smaller group. And be but because there are a few of them, it may be easier and it may be more cost-effective than to try and protect the whole group. So let me ask you before we go on, do you always go to PPE first? Do you expect your guys to wear the PPE and just get on with it without having thought about, hmm, can we eliminate or isolate that problem before we go on to minimise it? With these definitions behind us then of eliminate, isolate and minimise, let's look at how we're required to manage and document the process. Step two, research. Don't reinvent the wheel. 
There is heaps of information already out there on the internet on how to control hazards. Have your team research individually or collectively and get them together and discuss these ideas. Let's have a look at some examples of research. A. Regulations. They describe requirements applying to certain work situations and they are enforceable. You need to have a look at the list and see if your hazard or trade falls under one of these regulations. B. Approved codes of practice. They are sort of guidelines approved by the Minister of Labour under the Act. While they may be used in court as evidence of good practice, you are not legally required to adopt them. However, if you choose not to follow a code, you must be able to prove that your practice is at least as effective and that you've taken all steps practicable in these circumstances. C. Guidelines. And they may or may not have been helped by the Department of Labour and they may not have gone through a formal approval process, but, you know, trade literature, books, magazines, associations could guide you there. D. Safety data sheets and the like have detailed control practices. Contact your supplier and get copies of safety data sheets. E. Miscellaneous, you know, Google. There are so many good international web pages out there on health and safety. So just to re-emphasize, regulations are enforceable, so you need to check if they apply to you. For example, there are regulations on the use of cranes, boilers, passenger ropeways, and there are literally hundreds of codes of practice on things like the Kumara growing industry, lead-based paints, scaffolding in New Zealand, armed robbery advice for employees, and so on. Remember, we're trying to find the best practicable solution, which means you need to consider how much is known about how to prevent harm for a particular hazard. If you have a scaffolding company, you either need to follow the code of practice or document why you're not, because you have a safer method to follow. Your industry have helped put together a guide for you, and ignorance of that guide is no defense. So check to see if there is a guide already made for you and the hazard you are looking at. Step three, decide if it's applicable. Let's keep working through this uh, noisy printing machine example. When you found a code of practice and it talked about eliminating the noise, you know, and they had a question, can you change the printer for a quieter machine? Obviously, this would be a huge cost and may not even be affordable for the business. But then again, perhaps the company was looking for a way to replace its old, costly, and reliable machine and eliminating the noise could be another reason, another benefit for the upgrade. But in this case, your team decide, no, this is not a viable option. So you, you come across another question, what kind of maintenance schedule is the machine on? Simply maintaining the equipment can make it quieter. And you try it out, let's say with a printing example, and you find that, yeah, sure, it is quieter, but it's still too loud but you decide to add the maintenance schedule to the hazard register because it's a good place to have it. And in fact, you should already be maintaining or managing your plant. For example, um, how do you manage a company car? Keep it warranted and insured. So this is when the, the crossover occurs between managing safety and good business practice. Minimization is the only option left, and your team decide, right, we're going to give air defenders to our workers, and they're going to wear them. And you can consult with your equipment supplier about the type of equipment to give them. Now, if you're working through the, the guides and doing your research and procedures, and you found that you there's nothing there readily available for you, then you're going to have to come up with your own control measures. Step four, develop your own controls. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory, but you and the team may need to be creative if you have a new piece of equipment or process. Just remember the order that you need to work through, and that is to eliminate it, isolate, and then minimize. Step five, determining monitoring requirements. So far, you've identified the hazards, found out the significant, put some priority to them, determined the controls. Now you're finished, right? Or not quite. What this step is about is checking that the controls that you have in place are working. If you had decided machine guarding was your method under isolation and people are still getting their fingers chopped off, then obviously that control measure is not working. 
So monitoring is all about checking that controls are working. As a general principle, if you are issuing PPE, personal protective equipment to people, then you've acknowledged somewhere that there's a hazard and you've worked through the eliminate, isolate, minimize, and then you've decided to issue PPE. So if you're issuing people PPE, you therefore need to be monitoring that control. It gets a little more difficult when you're talking about the health effects. For example, if you put in ventilation for uh, welding, for, for the fumes from welding, how do you measure the residue within the air? How much is in the air? What sort of effect could that have on people? So there are two basic ways that we do monitoring. You need to measure the environment or measure the person. And you measure people in a couple of different ways as well. You can, um, the noise-induced hearing loss, you can measure the effect on the ear um, by the drop in the performance. So it's the effect on the body is one way. And the other way is uh, lead-based paint, for example, you could have lead in the, in the blood. So you can actually measure lead in the blood. I guess the point I'm trying to make here with regard to monitoring is that um, it, it can get quite complicated and you may need to get an outside help and this is when you start weighing up the cost again and you know how much is it going to cost me etc etc well I would just say go back to square one again and look at what we're trying to do we're trying to protect your people from harm and we're trying to make your business more profitable so that you're not exposed to risk legal and, and prosecutions and financial risk, but, but also long term. If your aim is to build up a long term profitable business, then doing this right from the start means that you're driving that risk right down. When you do go about testing, you need to take all practical steps to get the consent of the employees. It's important that staff understand why they're being tested and then told the results in a way that they understand. As the monitoring is done to maintain workers' health, anyone who refuses to take part must accept that this refusal will, will con weaken their case if in later years they claim to suffer an occupational illness which monitoring could have prevented. And implicit in the consent is that employers also have the right to this data. You may need to explain this to employees. For example, if everyone in the printing press workshop knew their individual results, and knew their hearing was being affected, but the manager did not, then no one may realise that the controls were not working. Step six. Finally, you have now thoroughly researched all the hazards and management options, which has included how much it will cost and how long it will take to control the hazards. Now in the area of cost, some of my colleagues are, I think, a bit, a bit naive here. They will tell you can't put a price on safety and that you must do everything possible to minimise risk. But all companies, no matter how big they are, do have a limit of resources that they can put into a problem. So I've already taken you through the legal perspective, which is to take all practical steps. And that does put a limit on how far you need to go. But my biggest issue with this sort of thinking is that with companies that do have a limited dollar to spend on safety, if they had 10 high risk hazards, I think it's better to try and spread the money and bring the risk to a moderate across all 10, then focus on two to three to bring to a low risk. So the final step here is to look at all significant hazards and weigh up the risk and the cost in terms of money and time and work out a plan that will allow you to best tackle all the significant hazards. This last step then is taking the big picture into account, the business cash flow, peaks in your operational tempo, and working out when and what to do. Action steps. Working through the hazard register, determine the risk of the significant hazards. Research controls. Having research decide if they're applicable. Document if they're not, then develop your own controls. Determining Determine monitoring requirements and add to the annual plan. Prioritise and schedule control measures based on practicality of solutions. 
Whew. There is a lot of information there, the last three chapters in particular. And I hope you've worked through them and taken the time to put the energy into it. The last three chapters are the core of your whole health and safety system. You should now have a working hazard register, which will define and allow you to manage, project manage, how you're going to deal with hazards within your workplace. It will have identified the risk to your business and perhaps to you personally. I can't stress enough how important it is to go through, if you have not yet, and nail the last three chapters.